I'm Julia, this is Livia, and today we'll be chatting with Howard Shapiro, the Chief Agricultural Officer at Mars Incorporated. He's also working on a moonshot project at Google X to end human stunting through better nutrition worldwide. And he founded alongside Justin Siegel, the Folded Aflatoxin Puzzle, an online game with over 500,000 players working to solve aflatoxin toxicity in the storage. So why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, your work, uh, and how it's changed in response to the pandemic so far? I began in agriculture uh, more than 65 years ago as a very young child working on a farm in upstate New York where we would go for weekends and holidays from school. I grew up in New York City, but I had a relative uh, post-Second World War who had a animal protein production facility and he grew all of his own grains to feed the animals. And so every kid in the extended family worked there as often as possible and sort of began my interest in agriculture. And then I had the Brooklyn Botanical Garden to go to, to look at the vast variety of plants in the world that they had collected. And I began to be very interested in plants, plant physiology, how plants work, and the whole nature of how plants have evolved over a very long period of time. And what that meant on scale and in, from all scales actually, forest, tropical rainforest, temperate rainforest, temperate forest, and then all the row crops. And that led to a, a vast education in plant science, first as a sunflower breeder, and then moving into maize very early in my career and working on maize and published a paper in 2018 with some colleagues from UC Davis and others on nitrogen fixation in maize, the first time it had ever been proven that maize could make its own nitrogen, picking up the material atmospherically in a very interesting and complex methodology. And then it just has continued. I mean, I've done a lot of genomics. I led the cacao genome project and initiated the peanut genome project and then initiated the African Orphan Ops Orphan Crops Consortium and the African Plant Breeding Academy, which is working on 101 food crops in Africa to improve the nutrition and a number of other characteristics which are critical for production of nutritious food and using nutrition, not caloric density as the meter to measure these things by. Because so much of what we have done is calories, largely hollow of nutrition. Not that they aren't good for you and you can live on them, but none of them have been improved with nutrition as one of its main driving forces. And so those sorts of projects have been the last period of time besides living in industry for many, many years. Gotcha. And before we get into your area of expertise a little more, I wanna ask you a question geared towards students, uh, which is what advice would you give to graduating seniors for those graduating in 2020 who are interested in working in agriculture or other food related industries? What skills do you recommend that students focus on developing and refining? It's such a vast question. I mean, does an individual want to work actually as a producer, as a small scale farmer, or work on a larger farm and learn all the complexities of what a large farm is involved with? They want to sell at farmer's markets, or they want to sell to Costco. Do they have any training in food safety, which is a burgeoning issue everywhere around the world? Um, a lot of the food that is eaten outside of places like the United States or the European Union or Canada, Australia, parts of China, et cetera, is really not safe. If we look at the contaminant loads that's in the food, whether it's listeria or aflatoxin or salmonella it, it's, it's a problem that we haven't really paid much attention to. And so students trained in quality and food safety, there's a huge demand for that type of knowledge. And then there's traditional plant science, breeding uh, post-Mendelian genetics, where an individual would take the pollen from the male and pollinate the female plant. And that was the way it was done for many, many, many years till the advance of biotechnology and everything that we see it's running along very fast, starting with talons and zinc fingers, then moving to CRISPR 
and now post CRISPR. And then the ability to make decisions based on technology much faster. That there is a chip that was developed in 2019 that has 1.2 trillion transistors on it. Now imagine what a, ch a chip was like in 1960 or when you all were born in the 80s and the advance that that has made so dramatically the cost of doing genomics or metagenomics or any of the genomics has fallen so fast that it's almost not an issue in the cost. Someone says, well, you can't do that because it costs X amount of money. X amount of money doesn't really exist anymore. And then if you talk about all the things a student could do uh, post-graduation, uh, I was at a meeting in Australia and the term wicked was used. Wicked meaning, um, challenging and complex issues. And there's a series of those that I think are predominating that are big and systemic and far reaching. There are those that are global and interdependent. They're nonlinear, which is really important. It's not all linear at this point. They're economic and environmental. They're personal, they're shared, and they're human. So where does a, where does a person wanting to work in agriculture want to fit? in that cacophony of possibilities. And remember, I would say pre-COVID-19, we all thought about supply chains as very symmetrical. You have a farmer down here and a couple buyers here and then brokers here. Then it goes to distributors and it goes to grocery stores. It's not that way anymore. And we, we now have an asymmetrical system that is taking over the sort of simplistic symmetry that we had before. And this is important to understand because it will predicate a different way of thinking about many of these problems. And then we go from what we refer to as first industrial world, though other people uh, refer to it differently, the developing world. And there's an exacerbation of some of these problems much more than others. There's not the necessary plant science to move things into nutrition per hectare versus caloric or yield per hectare. There's not the quality in food safety. So do you wanna work in a developing way versus in a uh, dictated way that is much more like the FDA or the EPA or the USDA? So an individual has a series of choices to make which are actually quite vast and then you've got things that we didn't have when I began called computing. We didn't really have analysis. We all carried around little notebooks in our pocket that we wrote on all the time, did our observation. That's all done on iPads now. We didn't have genetics at the level. All this feeds into two little interesting things called AI and machine learning. And how does that impact us? And you have Keystone companies like Benson Hill who have developed phenotyping software with a very high degree of accuracy where you can put the information into the system and then you can have a very fast way to determine what you should be breeding. And if the parents that you wanna work with can give you the answer you want. So where does a student wanna fit in this miasma of activity? And once you know that, then it's a question of trying to see if your education can tweak that so that you can step into it much more quickly or do you just go for experience in the field and join a company that is working in those areas and actually take your second education if you will clearly a vast array of choices that are available to students but would you say that there are any skills that immediately come to mind as useful for most agriculture uh, plant sciences students to learn while they're still in college or perhaps when they leave college? I mean, it's, it's difficult for me to, to sort of simplify it. You, you need systems biology. And you need to understand vast amounts of biology. You need to have a, a fair handle on chemistry. You need mathematics because so much of what we do is based in mathematics, whether it's the uh, sequencing, assembly or annotation of genomic information or proteomic information or transcriptomic information. All of these things really take a very heavy 
level of analytical skills. How you designed a field trial, it's all analytics. So can you be trained in these systematics, whether it's systematics of field trials or genetics or plant physiology or whatever dictate you want, can you fit into that? And how do you fit into that? And how do you want to live in that? So the rigor in education is different, I think, than it was five or 10 years ago because of the advances that we, I have seen literally in the last three years, even in genomics. There are names that you've never heard of like 454 or Selexa sequencers that have all been replaced by uh, Illumina and now uh, small companies like Oxford Nanopore and then superseded in the large scale production of information by the Beijing Genomic Institute known as BGI with their MG machines, which are so complicated and so extraordinary that things we never thought we could do in a lifetime are able to be done in six months to a year. So how does a student want to create rigor in their education? Again, it goes to some of these things. Do you want to be in food safety and quality? So you certainly need to know about chemistry. So the fundamentals of an education are really important at this point, besides the advanced studies in specific areas, whether it's plant breeding or plant physiology, genomics, genetics, animal science. Without that background of rigor in math, which is the queen of all the sciences, uh, it just doesn't happen. And you find yourself in a hole. Can you tell us a little bit about the non-technical roles associated with ag as well, perhaps from the policy side of things? Even in those, I think they're technical because if we look at good policy decisions are being made, it's data-driven almost exclusively. Is, does the soil have good till? What do we have to do to improve the soil? What are the nutrients that are missing? So to even consider policy, you have to be really bound into science in a very, very uh, distinct way. Uh, the distinguished Kathy Wotecki, who was the Undersecretary of Agriculture under President Obama, was a food scientist, but she was trained with so much rigor in fundamental science that she was able to move across different fields of, of thought and understand a vast array of issues that you're talking to which are policy wise, but if you don't understand the mathematics of climatology and what that means, if you don't understand the makeup of soil, so what has to be improved, these are all rigorous scientific pieces. What we have seen is many policymakers are not very well versed. And as a consequence, it doesn't work. But a good example would be a guy like A.G. Kawamura, who was for eight years Secretary of Food and Agriculture in California. Third generation farmer, well-trained, knew plant pathology, knew insect predation. It, he knew all of this information. So as a Secretary of Food and Agriculture, he was able to move very quickly across multidisciplinary science to help make informed policy. Well, I'm gonna throw another broad question out there. Hopefully not too broad, but... Uh... Before this pandemic, what did you personally think were the greatest challenges facing the global food system? And has your opinion changed at all these past two months? Well, the pre-pandemic, the major thing, I think there's a couple, I'll, I'll go twofold. One is chronic hunger and malnutrition causing stunting in children. That is because the typical diet is missing some really critical elements folates for neural tube development, iron to stop cretinism, and uh, more importantly, to create strong blood, hemoglobin, the, last of, uh, the, the lack of zinc in diets for cretinism, the uh, vitamin A for night blindness. If you look around the world, 37% of the children under five in Africa are stunted due to chronic hunger malnutrition, 48% of the rural population of India, and 7% of the population of the United States is stunted. These statistics come to me from Christine Stewart, 
a professor of um, food science uh, in the Department of Agriculture at UC Davis. What's interesting is that stunting is irreversible. It's not like having the flu and you have a vaccine or you take the polio vaccine and you can be uh, cured or protected. Stunting is caused in the pre-pregnancy diet of a young woman through the pregnancy and in the first 18 to 24 months when a child uh, post birth has a need for all of these things to develop completely. But if a young woman is deficient in all of these critical nutrients, macro, micro, and vitamins, then the child has no chance to really be any one of us. And not only are they small for their physical size and age, and not only are they not having the neural tube development, so they won't be Barbara McClintock, they won't be Jennifer Doudna, they won't be Norman Borlaug, they won't be Gertrude Kirsch. They'll suffer immunological suppression, they'll die young, and they cause in some places a 14% uh, loss to the GDPs of countries. So why wouldn't we try to fix chronic hunger and malnutrition? Why is it that at the top of our list of things? Why in the classes that are taught at UC Davis, don't we say one of the goals of every person going into agriculture, agriculture science, animal sciences, to end chronic hunger and malnutrition? Number two is aflatoxin, impacting 4.5 billion people annually, chronically, and causing early death through liver cancer in many parts of the world, and a causal factor of stunting as well. So how come we haven't fixed aflatoxin? I mean, where's all the world activity in aflatoxin? You have cancer research, you have, you have heart research, you have kidney research, you have all this research. And if we had one hundredth of that amount of money we would solve the issue to detoxify the soil so the Aspergillus flavus and the Aspergillus parasiticus would not invade the crops. Okay, how much of a loss does it really cause? Well, in a good year in the United States, it's about $40 million in the maize. In a bad year of aflatoxin, it's a billion, 400,000, 400 million dollars, excuse me, in losses. But in a a country like Kenya, which a few years ago had a terrible aflatoxin uh, uh, production in the maize, it killed 700 people because they had to eat. And so they thought, okay, we, we'll wipe the aflatoxin off. But you can't see it, you can't smell it, and you can't taste it. So these two things to me are driving forces pre-COVID-19. What they represent is a supply chain that's largely broken for large parts of the world. Now, looking today, if I believe any of the statistics, uh, when you have Vietnam and Thailand shutting their exports of rice down, when we worry about, is there gonna be enough wheat coming out of the Ukraine and Russia? If we look at what happened in pork in China, no one ever expected African swine flu to jump to a place called China. It was in Africa. Somehow it moved its way all the way around the world to China. What it did to the pork industry. These sorts of things are impacting the world systematically. Race two of Panama disease has impacted what's called Matoki in Uganda. Matoki is the food banana, not the, divert, the dessert banana like the Cavendish. No one really thought that race two of that particular Panama disease would show up in Colombia, but it did. And it has the potential to wipe out the Colombian Cavendish banana production. So how do you solve this? It's only through cutting edge technologies because we don't have 50 years or 20 years or whatever amount of time we need to fix these problems because people's lives de depend upon eating this food. Can you explain a little bit more about aflatoxin for viewers who might not know much about it? Yeah, I mean, most people hear about it because of peanuts. And um, 
we can't use peanuts in the United States that have aflatoxin in it. Um, in many places, what they do is they have a, a good bunch of peanuts and they throw a little bit of the aflatoxin peanut in it because there's a, a rate of ingestion that can be controlled by dispersion of, amongst good peanuts. So it's, th think of 20 parts per billion. That's, think in terms of years. It's like what it takes Usain Bolt to run the 200 meters one time in 32 years. That's how minuscule the percentage is that is considered to be unedible. When I travel around the world, especially in Africa, I buy food on the side of the road I have for 40 years. Uh, roasted maize that has been uh, cooked on an open fire, pretty safe. I think it kills most of the aflatoxin or the mycotoxins in maize. Peanuts, it's hard to eat a peanut in certain parts of the world because of the aflatoxin load. So this is something that is found everywhere in the world. If I were to walk out of my office on the campus here at UC Davis and go to the student farm and take a, a spoonful of soil, I would find aflatoxin in it. But it's not at a level where it's pernicious or dangerous. It just, it's just not, but it could be. Other parts of the world, it's dominant. So you, you have this area where people have tried to use biological control of the soil. It's failed miserably. Tens of millions of dollars have been spent on this, which is why we decided maybe we can use synthetic biology and detoxify it in storage. So have a powder you magically sprinkle on, you rub all your maize or peanuts with your hands with this uh, protein, which will take out or enzyme that will take out the aflatoxin. The urgency is so great. So what does it do? It, it lives in the soil. Aflatoxin knocks on the door of the plant and says, let me in. The plant goes, well, you look pretty friendly. Come on in. And it comes in and it invades the, the production, the ear of corn, the kernels, the peanuts. Most spices are aflatoxin laden. And can you fix it in a plant? Empirically, yes. How would you do it? I use this little funny technology called CRISPR. You could cut out the receptor section, glue it back together, and you would have the potential to have plants that were resilient against aflatoxin. Now, are people going to accept it? Well, they'll only accept it if we talk to them about it and they don't feel like we're hiding something. So there has to be an explanation period about using technology to solve these problems as well, which is what government policy should really be about in cases like this. The technology is genius. And so there's applications. Yeah, well, I myself was unfamiliar with all of the issues surrounding aflatoxin, so my mind is a little bit blown right now. So uh, you should, you should ask one of your teachers in one of your classes, tell me about aflatoxin in plants. <laughs> and demand that they give you an ex explanation and then ask them, how would you fix it? You fix the soil, that'd be great. But that's all failed. So my world now says to me, I've got to fix the plant so that when aflatoxin knocks on the door, it can't come in. Plant stands tall. They aren't infected. That's what technologies like CRISPR can give you. Yeah. And building off of what you've been saying a little bit, um, when thinking about the global food system, what existing social, economic, and policy constructs do you think are now being exposed as ineffective in light of the pandemic? Shall I give you a simple answer? You can yes. give whatever answer you want. <laughs> So the answer, the simple answer is everything is being exposed. Everything. The best farmers in America are suffering massively. Massively. I was on a call this morning with Solutions from the Land, which is a, 
an activist organization, I would call it a do tank versus a think tank. And um, a, a vast number of farmers, women and men across the United States uh, are getting together to say, how do we solve these problems? What do we do? And if we can solve them, do we have a responsibility as a global citizen to share all of our solutions with farmers around the world? And the answer, of course, is yes. Whether it's through the USDA or the FAO or the World Bank, however you want to do it, or through the African Union, all this information needs to be distributed. So they're working on 10 of the 17 SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals. There's 10 that deal specifically with agriculture or aquaculture. And that's a big question. But then the question is, people talk about, we need a theory of change. Actually, I think that's wrong. We need to reverse the words. It should be a change of theory because most of what we're doing right now is based on uh, holy cows. Oh, we can't do that because of this. Or we can't do that because of that. And most of what I see is we need to go from an observed change to an induced change. We need to induce the change. And with that, you have a change of policy and a change of context. And this becomes very, very important for your social policy question you asked earlier, that if you have an observed change, which has sort of been the driving force, look out in that field, looks like there are plants that are sick, versus can I induce a change, which is to make healthy plants that are resilient, that are nutritious, that are high yielding, um, they can tolerate climate change vagaries, pest and disease resistant, water and nutrient use efficient, then you can have a change of policy and of context. But we need, that's a shift because we've been going down the same path post second world war in agriculture pretty much till we had the GMO revolution, which kind of bit us in the wrong place because it wasn't adopted globally the way we should. And CRISPR, if everything goes well, should not fail the same way. We should be smarter about it. And then you come to an area, how do you measure this stuff you wanna do? Do you have an agriculture performance index? What would it look like? Well, the first of five things would be resilient productivity. Resilient productivity. I don't like the word sustainable. It was defined more than 35 years ago. And I don't go to a dentist that uses technology that was defined 35 years ago. You want modern. The word resilient means the ability to respond quickly to a problem. That's what you have to have, resilient productivity. Number two, profitability. I don't care how you define profitability. Is it social profitability, cultural profitability, economic profitability, environmental profitability? I don't care what your definitions are. It must be profitable. Without that, there's no incentive then you get back to this sort of chronic hunger and malnutrition. You must have good governance over production and you must have solid management as we think about this stuff. Is it landscape scale? Is it backyard scale? You must have all of the intentionality from good governance and solid management. And then most important, my lights just went off. There we go again. The office shut them off. I hadn't moved in a while. <laughs> Is Social inclusion. How do we include everybody in solving the problems that become our food system? A few years back, I was one of the authors, co-authors of the midterm review of the consultative group of international agriculture research. 16 centers spread around the world, referred to as the CGIAR. And they asked us to tell them what should they work on and we had a meeting that we went to as observers, myself and John Beddington, then chief scientist of the United Kingdom. And they had walls full of sticky notes, maybe 10,000 sticky notes. It was so incredible. And we asked them, tell us, what should the CGIAR work on? All of this. We need to work on all of this. 
And so John and I and a couple others wrote the report. Number one was nutrition. Everyone should work on nutrition. It's the, it's the most important thing in agriculture. I'm not dis uh, discounting yield. We've got yield. We've reached our sort of threshold yield in most crops anyway. We got to fix degraded land, where you call it degraded because we worked it too long and we haven't given it nutrients. We haven't let it rest, whatever methodology you want to talk about. We haven't figured out how to get rid of the aflatoxin. Waste. Think about the waste stream in food right now. There was a picture in national news about a farmer in Florida turning under fields of ready to eat crops because the supply chain wasn't able to take them right now due to COVID-19. Imagine turning under food with your tractor and then it becomes resilience, this ability to respond quickly. And then because I'm living in big data, big data becomes a really big issue. How do we take the data that is being generated by satellites and drones and everything else and make that available to everyone? If you were to solve those five problems, everything else we've talked about would go away. Maybe a little off topic, but as someone who um, is not majoring in anything agriculture related, I would really love to hear you speak for a moment on the everyone portion that you just mentioned, how everyone needs to get involved in solving these problems. Is there anything that average citizens or people who care about these problems can do to help usher in positive change, even if it can't be, you know, directly done? If we would have answered your question nine months ago, <laughs> it, it would have had a lot to do with the true cost of agriculture because we don't pay for lots of externalities, loss of topsoil, contamination of our waterways and water tables by over use of nitrogen fertilizers and other things, carbon sequestration, paying farmers and foresters for carbon a fair price. What is that price? Today, it's a very different conversation. In many ways, it's about can we actually get food to the people who need it the most? We're very fortunate in California. I mean, it's, we live in a, a food paradise. Whether it's milk you want or chicken or beef or any kind of vegetative material, fruits, it's almost we're a nation state in that way. And within our borders, we produce everything we want. And it reminds me of the word paradise which, which was a walled garden where everything you needed could be found. Most of the world doesn't have that. Even in the highly productive agricultural states that produce most of the grains and cereals, legumes, pulses, whatever you want to talk about, parts of Canada or the United States, Australia, China, European Union, we don't understand how fragile the whole system is. A good example, 2014, I think it was, there was a failure of the wheat crop in the Ukraine. And because of that, there were some restrictions on wheat that was coming out of places like Russia. You remember the Arab Spring? It yes. started a protest against the price of bread because the wheat prices had gone through the roof due to a failure in Ukraine. So the fact that we're so interconnected no longer allows us to have a fully local viewpoint. Again, in California, we grow rice, we grow wheat, we grow soybeans, we grow everything we need. But that's the exception to the rule. Many other places are importing, even prolific nations like Australia in agriculture or New Zealand or India the largest producer of pulses in the world is also the largest importer of pulses in the world. We're from Canada. Years ago, 20 years ago, you would never thought you could grow these things in Canada. Now they grow perfectly because of climate change. If you would have told me as a young scientist, people will be growing cotton in Kansas. I would have laughed 
till I fell off my chair. Similarly, growing maize in Canada, they grow maize, short season maize in Canada now. It never was anticipated in my education there would be a production like that. So all of this is changing simultaneously. How big is the Ogallala aquifer? How much water is in that aquifer? Nobody can tell us. So do we use conservation agriculture? Do we put in irrigation systems? Because one day that's gonna go dry if it's not recharged. But we don't know how much we have, so we should use it in a precious sense as opposed to an abundant sense. We should have plants that are water use efficient that use 65% less water so they can grow perfectly well in places that are now becoming dry. So how does it all fit together? It's, it's raising awareness, but in a moment of the pandemic, it's hard to tell someone about this because they're really just trying to eat. They're trying to buy mac and cheese for their children, or whatever else they can buy at the Costco or their local supermarket, the Whole Foods, the co-op, you know, the Nugget, whatever you go to, Kroger, Safeway. It, it, all of these places are struggling to try to deliver in a way that is affordable from the people who are the poorest. A $1,200 check doesn't go very far at the grocery store anymore. And if you have a typical family of four or five people, think about what it really takes to feed them at least twice a day. And the numbers about how we've thought about agriculture in the past, pre-COVID-19, was laissez-faire. There's always gonna be food. It will always be available. And I think this has been a wake-up call and a shocking wake-up call to bring that to bear that we can't believe in everything we've seen in the past that it will be the same in the future. Um, there's no clear answers, obviously, but in the aftermath of this pandemic, do you have any speculations regarding what new jobs could be created, both in agriculture and on the supply, the supply chain side of things? Um, and alternatively, do you see any emerging fields or roles that are gonna be accelerated because of this pandemic and everything that's happened because of it? Well, that's about a five hour conversation. Um, <laughs> I'll try to condense it down a little bit here. I was always an admirer of the Civ Civilian Conservation Corps that came at a time of the Great Depression when we had unemployment at the level we have it now. Uh, this is post or during the Great Dust Bowl. You may remember that from your readings. And Thanks. yes, grapes, bread. Yes. So what if, what if we took some portion of this population that is currently unemployed and put them to work for the Civilian Conservation Corps of America? And we, we built hedgerows on fields that are conservation agriculture. Hedgerows hold biological diversity better than almost anything ever. What if we built swales to catch water everywhere like we did in the Conservation Corps and are still visible, if you will, from the air if you fly over certain parts of the West and Southwest? What if we gave help to the farmers that needed it the most? The average age of the farmers, I think, 65 years old right now. And more farms in the Midwest are owned by widows than almost any other group of people because their husbands have passed away and they're renting their farms out. What if we put people to work on these farms? Not everyone is fit or wants to do a farm job. But what if we said some portion of the population is going to plant trees? Some portion will work in fields. Some portion will work in parks around the world. I mean, it's sort of like our own domestic activity set based on the Conservation Corps. Imagine what would happen if everyone went to work and, and made a reasonable national wage, $15 an hour, whatever it is, and they were fed three meals a day and they were able to send money back to their families 
like many third world laborers do all around the world to their families, whether it's in Mexico or India or Pakistan or Bangladesh or back to Eastern Europe when they're working in Britain or other EU countries. We, we have a workforce that wants to work. They don't want to sit at home. I mean, TV is not that interesting, even if you have Netflix. And what can, what can we do to make these people functional and get them outside? And, you know, all the precautions, that's easily done. But we just assume that everything's going to come back to the way it was. And that wasn't true in the Great Depression. And it won't be true this time. And while I'm not an epidemiologist, I talk to lots of them who I have friends in this field. It's not over. It's not over in Italy. It's not over in China. It's not over in the United States. It might be over in New Zealand because the prime minister there, she's such an enlightened individual. They, they caught it quickly and took care of it. But let's say it's, it's not over in the United States and some of the predictions that we're going to have a second wave and then a, let's get people to work now. Let's, let's take the idleness out of society and have them do good. And there's plenty to be done. Uh, you know, farmers need help, whether it's putting up fence rows or taking care of the animals. And the fact that we have animals that we don't know what to do with because the slaughterhouses are going down. We, we put everything in our hands into a couple institutions these giant slaughterhouses. Do we need to have more slaughterhouses to take care of it so we don't have the density of the production that are more local? I mean, I could go on and on and on. Um, I'm not suggesting everybody should go out and cut lettuce in the fields to ship it by truck to New York City, but there's lots of agriculture. There's lots of landscape ecology. There's lots of repairs in our waterways that could be done if we had a way to think it through for the benefit of society. And those individuals really will go back to work eventually, but a lot of it will take 18 to 24 months, I think, to come back to a, what we call a norm, largely based on how fast we get a vaccine. I can only imagine how impactful it would be to have a New Deal type arrangement for agriculture but that sounds too sensible. I don't know if it would ever happen. Well, it, it should happen, and, and I agree, it, it, it's, it's just logical, but eventually the farmers are gonna throw their hands up and look at the percentage of last year's crop that wasn't sold. Look at the percentage of land not planted to crops today. Look at the number of animals in the pipeline or not. And why are they dumping milk? Yeah, I mean, for uh, the, the other day, I heard from one of the guys in Indiana, his co-op is dumping 4 million gallons. Well, you have to keep milking the cows. If you stop milking them, they won't produce milk again till they calve. So it, it's, it's, it's kind of like this system. You've got to keep milking the cows. So why hasn't the government said, we'll buy all of the milk you can dry with fat solids for 80 cents a gallon, which is about break even completely. Fine. What do we do with it? We're going to give it to people who need it. Well, that's fine in the United States, but how about in Africa or South America? Well, they don't have clean water, so they can't add that water back to the milk powder. All right. Why don't we have an X prize for a $10 water purification system? or a hundred dollar community water purification system. Why aren't we thinking through systematically? We have milk we're dumping, let's save it, let's store it, let's get a way to purify water immediately, which would solve problems for massive numbers of people around the world, drive it on solar power, so they can rehydrate the milk. Yeah, well, I mean, the concept of a federal job guarantee it's been explored before in classes that I've taken, but I've never heard um, the idea of a federal job guarantee oriented around the food system. You usually see it focus on construction, the built environment, fixing roads, fixing bridges. So, I mean, this is, yeah, I think it, 
but the, the great the, idea. The CCC, as it was called, did all those things too. They built roads, they built buildings. Um, if you go to a national park, most of the big lodges were built by these crews. So that's all included. I'm, I'm not leaving anything out because the infrastructure needs repair too. We all know that. And in a time like this, we need to take the opportunity to fix some of these things that need to be fixed. But the agriculture piece, the environmental piece, taking advantage of the excess we have in production and figuring out how to put it in Tetra Pak, which can be shipped around the world. Tetra Pak, if I remember, has facilities that can fit on the back of a semi-tractor trailer. So take all the fruits and vegetables that you can puree and then you can store them and give them away to people to utilize. We're not having a systematic thought process. We, we put tactics on things everywhere. And it turns out a tactic is not a strategy. And what we need is a system strategy to think this through. Again, not a theory of change, but a change of theory. I wanna ask you one last student-centric question, which is, how can students turn these problems you've been discussing into opportunities? What career advice would you give to them? Um, we've been asking all of our speakers this question and two things that have been brought up is running for local office and entrepreneurship. What are your thoughts on that? Everything is an opportunity. You know, some people think of the cup half full, some of them think it half empty. Um, running for office, it's a great idea. We need your generation to run for office and take over from some of the dead weight that exists in government around the world. We need you to be the next level of entrepreneurship. I mean, I never thought I would see so much happen in my lifetime. For me, it's like witnessing the Wright brothers fly for the first time to supersonic jets what has happened in genetics. We used to walk the field with paper and pencil. Now you do it with iPads. It used to take months to do genomic work. I carry around with me, uh, I'll even show you. An Oxford nanopore sequencer. This will actually do a modest sequence that is useful information. It's powered by a plug that goes into your computer, your USB port. So I can go and extract DNA in the field, run a, a genome sequence overnight and come up with information. Now, did I ever think I was gonna, I never thought I would have a cell phone. I, you know, now that I've got a watch like Dick Tracy, I can talk to my watch. <laughs> what I'm impressive is I've got this little device that changed my life. I never thought this would happen. What is your generation as a challenge gonna give us to help us solve our problems that you think are critical that older people haven't realized or understood or thought through the way you all thought through this. And that's where we need to be. I mean, that's the opportunity. The, the other place is I was very fortunate to have worked with some brilliant individuals and, and talked extensively with people like Norman Borlaug, the father of the Green Revolution. And one thing he said to me one time, and I think it's true, people have criticized the Green Revolution, which uh, forestalled starvation in Pakistan and India for 200 million people. It was MS Swaminathan and Borlaug who developed a dwarf wheat product that really didn't fall over in the rain. It was very interesting. Winds didn't blow it over. And he never thought that nobody would improve it. He assumed that this was the beginning. And late in his life, when I was at a conference with him, someone stood up and started yelling at him, the Green Revolution, down with the Green Revolution, look what it's done. And Norman said, how come no one improved it? It's from the late 60s, early 70s. It's now been 40 years. How come there haven't been quantum improvements? But we're, we're kind of go along society sometimes that if things are working, okay, it works. may not be perfect. Your generation has to be the mirror to say, that's not good enough. 
just because you say it's good doesn't mean I have to believe it's good. So you have to challenge everything, which again goes back to change the theory. You want to induce change. You don't want to observe change. You have the ability to induce change, whether it's in agriculture or social science, chemistry, physics, poetry, photography, whatever you want to talk about. This generation's power is that you know a lot. And now you have to use it. And, and again, how do you use it? I think it's 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You disregard a lot of what you've been taught and say, I have a better idea about that, whether it's to bake a loaf of bread or to figure out the way to detoxify soil of aflatoxin. It's, it's really up to you all. And artificial intelligence and machine learning, which is second nature to you all, in this generation you're talking about, you should think about it every day to solve a world problem because they'll give you insights. That's a wonderful way to put it. And it appears that we have arrived at our final question to kind of wrap up everything that you've explored um, in this past hour. If you were to write a book reflecting on this time, what would the title be? Well, remember, I'm, I'm old and uh, I'm on my way out, not my way up, like you all are. Um, I'm not sure what the title would be. Um, it's certainly been a surprise. You know, uh, these last three months, nothing in my life prepared them. Every experience I've ever had, every great person I ever was fortunate to talk to or collaborate with, nothing, nothing, nothing could have made me believe this would happen in my lifetime. I mean, I knew about the Spanish flu, the pandemic. I lived through polio and the Salk vaccine. But this is something that is so much more profound. And one has to understand that the thing that we have going for us, if we have it, is leadership. And if you don't have that kind of inventive thought, um, who sees the future through science, and so I'm using the word science in its broadest sense, then you're really pretty much out of luck. And so do I worry about something? If the title of the book could be, I'm worried about you uh, because you have a long time to go in your lifetime, 50, 60, 70 more years, what's it gonna be like? That would be the subtitle. I'm worried about you and what's it going to be like for the next 50 years. I would grab a book that said that on the front. I'm worried about you. <laughs> worried about what? That's a good one. Well, I think that brings us to the end of this interview. Thank you so much, Dr. Shapiro, for giving such a fascinating multidisciplinary talk. I myself uh, found it absolutely riveting, even though I lack some of the background knowledge uh, about these issues in agriculture. I think you really said some things that will speak to all students, all students who care about the global food system and what can be done to enact positive change. So thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us. Thank you. It's uh, complicated times. I hope we solve all these issues as quickly as possible for the benefit of society and humanity. Mm -hmm.